Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Errol Flynn and Martha Scott in Virginia City. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Man's endless quest of gold has taken him to the ends of the earth, along a trail marked with the mansions of those who succeeded and with the bleached bones of those who failed. Fabulous cities have risen overnight and died as quickly. Most fabulous of all was the roaring Nevada town, Virginia City, home of the Comstock Load, and mother of more wealth than man had ever seen before in one place. Tonight, the Virginia City of 80 years ago comes to life in our play, starring Errol Flynn and Martha Scott. Errol playing the same part he had in the Warner Brothers picture. It's a thrilling story of a little-known episode in the war between the states. A battle for treasure fought by those who served their flags in secret. But for the man and the girl of our drama, the stakes were greater than gold. They were love and life itself. Pioneering in the Old West was exciting. And American women did more than their share of the job and a good deal less than their share of ordinary conveniences. All the gold in Virginia City couldn't have bought them a cake of Lux toilet soap. Because it took plenty of pioneering to develop that too. Pioneering both in science and the art of beauty. The result is a product dedicated to the great granddaughters of those hardy feminine pioneers. And incidentally, one that helps to keep them better looking longer than their great grandmothers. The women of the 20th century may forget the pioneering that it took to develop Lux toilet soap, but they never forget his one luxury that's a bargain. And now we have another bargain in sheer entertainment. The curtain rises on the first act of Virginia City, starring Errol Flynn as Kerry Bradford and Martha Scott as Julia, with Frank McGlynn as Abraham Lincoln. It's 1864, the third year of the war between the states. In Richmond, Virginia, stronghold of the Confederacy, a grim, dark building looms through the mists along the James River. Soldiers guard its iron gates with watchful eyes and ready guns. For this is Libby Prison, where Union captives are held for the duration of the war. But far beneath the ground in a black tunnel, three of these Union soldiers are making their bid for freedom. With worn-out, clumsy tools, they work in desperate haste, digging and clawing at the damp earth. They're grimy, unshaven, their blue uniforms torn to shreds. At intervals, they pause in their labor, gasping for air. Prison powder magazine should be right above us now, Carrie. How much more we we got to dig? Well, let's see. I figure we've, we've come about 48 feet from the cell. About seven feet more. Seven more feet and we're free. Oh, my pa must have been a beaver. I've been digging so long, I... All right, Marblehead, never mind the talk. Just keep on digging. Come along, I'll have you too. Oh, sure. Seven more feet. I could do it with my bare hands. Listen. What is it, Captain? I heard something. Back there in the cell. All right, you men. I'm out of that tunnel. It's Herbie. You hear me? I'm out of there. Well, Kerry, what do we do? No use. They've got us. I'm not going back. Let him come down here and kill me. Shut up. I'm not going back, I tell you. I'm... Shut up. Come on. We're going back. That tunnel wasn't a bad idea, Captain Bradford. But you see, I happened to learn that you were digging it three days after you started last spring. Three months and 12 days ago. And you didn't stop us, eh? That was mighty nice of you, Irby. Let the boys amuse themselves. Let them get within a couple of feet of escaping from this hole and then shove a knife in them. Very considerate. It was merely my idea of how to prevent an enemy intelligence officer from doing further harm to the Confederacy. You three men know the penalty for a third escape try? Yeah, firing squad, isn't it? Or would you rather see us hung? I'm going to give you just one more chance, Bradford. Meanwhile, if you want to dig further, you're welcome. Only no matter where you come up, Captain... I'm afraid you'll find a few bayonets waiting for you. That's all. Oh, no. No, Irby, that's not quite all. 
Maybe you'd better have me shot or hung right now. Because if I ever run into you again, anywhere, any time, I'm going to collect for that tunnel every last foot of it. I'll be at your service, Captain. Captain Irvy? Yes? There's a lady waiting to see you, sir. A lady? She said to tell you Miss Julia Haynes, sir. Where is she? In your office, sir. Julie. Hello, Vance. Surprised to see me. Oh, Julie, I, I wondered if I'd ever see you again. Why didn't you answer my letters? There was nothing to say, Vance. But what about you? What's been happening? I knew you were here, of course. Certain people at Virginia City told me. Oh, it's simple enough. Here, sit down. They gave me this job while I was convalescing from Chancellorsville. Mm -hmm. But I'm fit again, ready for service as soon as they can find some use for me. Vance, the war is going badly for us, isn't it? Very badly, Julie. The South has nothing left to fight with except the will. Wars are won with gold nowadays, not with men. But if the South had gold to buy supplies, arms, powder... Who's going to stake us? Jeff Davis is broke. We're lucky if we can last another six months. I'm not thinking about credits. I'm thinking of a gift to the South. Of five million dollars in gold bullion. Julie, you're crazy. Where in the world could we get it? In Virginia City. But that's a Yankee stronghold. Vance, you know Virginia City. It's one of the greatest mining centers in the world. Yes, but... And I... the biggest mine owners there are Southerners. Go on, Julie. Dr. Cameron, Armistead, Marshall, all Southerners. Southerners whose loyalty adds up to $5 million, which they're willing to give to the Confederacy. But they can't move it from there without a fight. They need a leader, someone strong, someone who knows all the country between that's why I came to you. You're the only one who can do it, Vance. Is that the only reason you came to me? Vance, you're my oldest friend. I, I knew I could trust you. Julie, tell me. Why did you leave your home here and go north? Was it because of me? No, I... Tell me the truth. Partly that. Because I wasn't sure. But mostly because I wanted to see life in the world outside. Wanted to be a singer. I had a voice, you know. Then the war and, <laughs> and the concert stage to singing in the Sazerac Saloon at Virginia City. Julie. Why not? Virginia City's full of Yankees. The Union soldiers talk and I listen. I'm such a good listener. What I hear, I pass on. Well, the Yankees would call me a spy. And that's why you came. To get your help, Vance. I want you to see President Davis. Tell him the plan. Will you, Vance? I'll arrange for both of us to see him tonight. Herbie uh, certainly dealt us an extra ace when he didn't shut off this tunnel. How much more, Captain? Just about finished. There's the floor of the powder magazine. We better talk low. I still don't see what good it's going to do us, Captain. You heard what Irby said. They'll be waiting up there for us. Marblehead, will you please shut up? Olaf, did you bring those rags? All I could get, Captain. Here. But look, Captain. Pile I... them up under the floor. Now crawl back and get that can of coal oil. Be careful with it. Don't worry, Captain. Coal oil? What are we going to do with that, Captain? Oh, Marblehead, whoever named you is a genius. Look, there's the powder magazine right up there. We're going to drench the rags with coal oil, put a match to it. And crawl back just as fast as we can and wait for the big noise. Oh, oh! you, you mean we're going to blow our way out? What else? Or in. We won't know which until tonight. Vance, what's that over there? Where those soldiers are? Those are earthworks, Julie. The last line of defense. Oh, is it as bad as that? Are they that close? Seventy miles. At Spotsylvania Courthouse. But they'll never take Richmond now, Julie. You've brought us new life, new hope. Have I? Vance, remember the old days? The parties father used to give in the old house? <laughs> you were such a funny little boy, Vance, with your tight trousers and red cheeks. We watched the dancing from the stairs. Oh, it was fun growing up together, wasn't it, Vance? I wish it had lasted forever. We were close then. When I was 14, you gave me a ring made of twisted violet stems. And you slapped me when I threw it away. I've thrown away so many things since then, Vance. Sweet things like that. Perhaps if you'd slapped me a little harder or meant it when you did... Julie, don't. 
guess it's silly to live in the past, isn't it? When do you start west? President Davis wants me to leave tomorrow. By troop train to the border, then by stage. We'll meet later then in Virginia City. Remember, when we meet there, we've never seen each other before. I'm an expert at that now. Treating friends as strangers and enemies as friends. I'll remember. Vast! What in the name of... Vast, look! Over there in the sky! It's a fire! Julius the prison! Keep a line around the west wall. Don't let anyone through. Captain Abbey. Well, did you get into Bradford's cell? Yes, sir, but it's empty. The three prisoners have escaped. Gentlemen, allow me to introduce Captain Kerry Bradford, one of our most reliable sources of enemy intelligence. Captain Bradford has just come from Richmond. He knows more inside affairs of the Confederacy than anybody but Jefferson Davis. Isn't that what they say about you, Captain? Well, General Hooker, at the moment, I guess I know more about the inside of Libby Prison. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, at the time of his capture, Captain Bradford was tracing a report of gold shipments to Richmond. I said then the report was ridiculous, and I still say so. Am I right, Captain? No, sir. The rebels did receive gold, but only in small amounts. Right now, though, they're planning a much bigger transfer to the value of several million dollars. Where could they get that much gold? Just one place, sir. Three of the richest mines in America happen to be owned by Southern sympathizers out in the Nevada Territory. A town called Virginia City. All they're waiting for is a chance to ship it out. And they will, unless we get there first. Mm. How soon can you start for Virginia City, Captain? Any time, sir. We're already packed. Good. Draw what money you need from the paymaster and get the next coach west. And uh, good luck to you. Thank you, sir. Hey, driver, what's the next stop? Red Prairie, about 30 miles. Thanks. Will you please close that door? You're stepping all over me. What? Oh, sorry, ma'am. I didn't quite realize. It's quite all right. Hey, Marblehead, why don't you move over a little? Can't you see you're crowding the lady? Oh, me? I didn't step on it. Go on, sit over that way. Uh, is that better, ma'am? Thank you very much. Oh, not at all. You should know they shouldn't try to crowd six people into one coach. But as long as they have, I guess we ought to introduce ourselves. Uh, uh, my name's Carrie Bradford. Uh, these two gentlemen are good friends of mine. There's Mr. Olaf Dawson and... Uh, my name is Upjohn. Benjamin Upjohn. Oh, Mr. Upjohn. How do you do? And this gentleman over here... Is... Vincent is my name. Oh, Mr. Vincent. Well, gentlemen, I'd like you all to meet Miss... Uh, Miss... Uh, I don't believe I caught the name. I don't believe I mentioned it. Well, that's what I meant. Julia Hayne. Oh, thank you. Uh, gentlemen, Miss Julia Hayne. All right, Kerry, you win. Here's your dollar. Oh, put it away, won't you? Put it away. Well, we bet, didn't we? You said you'd get acquainted with her before we hit Kansas City. <laughs> How interesting. Uh, yes, uh, my friend has a great sense of humor, ma'am. That's mm. why we call him Marblehead. You can understand why. If you'll excuse me, I'd like to get on with my book. Here, Marblehead, take back your dollar. Oh, my goodness. Oh. That's all right, just a little bump. Nothing to be alarmed about. My congressman's going to hear about this road. In fact, I shall take it up with President Lincoln. He's kind of busy right now. There's a war on, you know. Don't mention war to me, please. It's bad for business. Uh, what is your line, mister? Uh, life insurance. Standard mutual. Uh, perhaps I can interest you in a policy? No, thanks, Ranger. That would not be a good risk. Oh, I wouldn't say that. Uh, what sort of business are you in, Mr. Vincent? Well, um, suppose you say I handle hardware. A uh, full line? Oh, full enough. Yeah. Take a look at this. Uh, that's a pistol. Uh, one of my samples. Pass it around. Pretty job, isn't it, Mr. Bradford? Yes, very nice. Oh, uh, any of you men happen to be carrying guns? Well, not me. I never touch them. Me neither. Why do you ask? Uh, this country is not quite so soft as you might think. You ever hear of John Morell? No, who's he? Oh, you mean uh, Morell's guerrillas? Yeah, sure, I've heard of them. A lot of cutthroats, aren't they? Uh, I take that gun now, Mr. Bradford. Thank you. Well, this is their stomping ground. Morell, he specializes in stagecoaches <laughs> and passengers. I guess we would be quite a haul at that. That's what I figured. Now, just sit still, gentlemen, or this pretty gun might go off. You put that gun away. There's no point in making any noise. You just hand over quietly, nobody will get hurt. Hmm, I take it that you're the famous Mr. Morell. You're a smart fellow. So I take you first. Come on, hand over, if you please. Oh, but that's the point. I don't please. Don't be funny, Bradford. This gun has a hair trigger. Oh, it won't go off. Would you like to bet? Please, he'll kill you, Mr. Bradford. Why? 
It's pain. Sudden solicitude is astounding. I beg your pardon, Mr. Morell. You were saying... Uh... I don't particularly want to shoot you, Bradford, but I don't mind. Now, you look back out the window, you see why. About 50 men on horseback have been following us for the last 10 miles. Morell's gorilla. Morell's gorilla. <laughs> I think maybe I outdraw you, eh, Mr. Bradford? Yeah, maybe. But I've got something pretty good in my hand, too. The bullets out of your gun. Why, you... Your little derringer looked too well used to be a sample, Morell. Anyway, I didn't like your face. In fact, I still don't. So I'll show you one of my samples. Careful, Morell. My gun's got a hair trigger, too. Hey, Marblehead, tell the driver to stop. Hey, driver, pull up! Now, Morell, you're going to tell your boys playtime's over. You're coming along with us. Here to come, Kerry. Now, lean out of that window, Morell. Start talking. Make it fast and clear. And don't forget I've got my finger on the trigger. Put up your guns, man! This fellow has a drop on me. If you start shooting, he flog me. Stay here and don't follow. He's not fooling, he means it. And so do I. And to think that I tried to sell him life insurance. Do you think we're safe with him riding up there on the top? Don't worry, mister. He's tied up so tight he can't move his fingers. But I don't ever want to be in a worse gym than that. How about you, ma'am? Uh, I beg your pardon, I was reading. I said we were in a bad jam. <laughs> Don't you think the heroics were a trifle exaggerated? Oh, you think he didn't mean it? I want to tell you, oh, ma'am. never mind, Olaf. Huh? Oh, yeah. Why, right, Miss Hayne, you're pretty cool being able to read right now. Do you think so? Well, most women would be sort of upset. Well, perhaps I'm different. I should say you were, particularly since you've got your book upside down. <gasps> oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it was. Silly, wasn't it? Yeah. And I'm sorry if I've been rude. Oh, not at all, Miss Hayne. Haven't even said thank you. If you hadn't been here, Mr. Bradford, I don't know what might have happened. Do you believe in predestination? You know, I just had to be here. So did you. So did Morell. There's probably some future reason for it. You're not serious. Well, of course I am. I believe in those things. You don't think this meeting was an accident, do you? Why, we've been leading up to this for years. Ever since I was, well, about that high and you were in your cradle. Well, it just had to happen. Very glad it did. <laughs> hey, Gary, you better take that dollar again. Oh, you shut up. All together now. Keep it, boys. Push! Harry! Are we going to be stuck in the middle of a stream all day? Oh, we're doing our best, Julie. Say, you know what the trouble is, don't you? It's that 180 pounds of yours. Come on, out you get. What do you mean? Well, do you think you can sit up there and play the lady while we struggle in the mud? Come on, I'm going to carry you over to the bank. You are not. Oh, lady, I'm not asking you. I'm just telling you. Come on, get down off of there. Carrie, stop. Put me down. What's Put that? me down, do you hear? Well, certainly. Just which part of the stream would you like to be dropped in? Huh? What? You wouldn't dare. Well, how could I help it? It's predestination. Mm, fortunately, I don't believe in it. Oh, but I do. You see, before we were born, it was decided. Someday I'd be standing in the middle of a stream with a lovely girl in my arms. Helpless. No, not so very helpless. I'd look at her, she'd look at me, love shining in her eyes. Now listen, Carrie Bradford. Then slowly I'd lift her head and kiss her. Carrie. Oh, sorry. Just had to do this, Julie. Who am I to interfere with predestination? Here you... Oh, Carrie. There we go! Get him! Olive! 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 What's the matter? Morel, he got away! We stay here about 20 minutes, folks. Don't get lost in the dark. <laughs> Hmm. Well, I must be a stimulating companion. That expression is definitely far away. I was half dreaming, Carrie. Nice dream. About us. We were climbing a mountain together, toward a sunrise. But when we neared the top, you stopped me, almost as if there was something on the other side you didn't want me to see. There isn't, Carrie, is there? <laughs> what could there be? That's what I mean. You, you seem so, well, evasive is not the word, but elusive. I know so little about you, really. Well, do I know any more about you, your other life, family, men you must know, what your place is in Virginia City? That's your home, isn't it? Yes, it is now. 
This time tomorrow night, we'll be there. Sounds dreadfully final. Uh-huh. But it isn't, is it, Julie? I will see you there, won't I? It's not a large place. Oh, you know I don't mean that. Look, Julie, I'm not a fool. I know what's happened during the last few days, and so do you. Can't end now, can it, Julie? I don't know. I can't tell yet. Only promise me this, Carrie, for as long as we're together, or whenever we meet again, let's not climb mountains or cross bridges till we know what's on the other side. Promise? Uh-huh. I promise. In just a moment, our stars, Errol Flynn and Martha Scott, will bring us Act Two of Virginia City. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act Two of Virginia City. Starring Errol Flynn as Carrie Bradford and Martha Scott as Julia. Hide this way, boys. The daughter Rick is rum and rapture. The one and only Sazerac Saloon. Famous from Philly to Frisco. This is Virginia City, a sprawling, roaring boomtown. For a drink of bad whiskey is costly, and a human life is cheap. Once within its borders, Julia Hain disappeared completely, lost herself in the sea of noise and lusty living. But now Carrie has traced her to the Sazerac Saloon. What'd you say her name was? Julia Adams, greatest attraction we've had since Ladder Crab Tree. I can imagine. How long has she been working here? Three, nearly four years. She just got back from St. Louis, and the boys sure did miss her. I'll bet they did. <laughs> Hello, Julie. Oh, hello, Carrie. I saw you come in. How do you like Virginia City? Well, I haven't made up my mind. But I can tell Virginia City likes you. <laughs> this is very funny. Why didn't you tell me about it? You mean working here? I didn't think it mattered much. At least I hoped it wouldn't. Well, I don't know that it does. We're all friends, aren't we? You and me and a couple of hundred other people around here. These people like me and respect me. They discourage those who don't. Hmm, that's a nice arrangement. Would it help your percentage any if you had a drink with me? Thanks. I'm paid to be pleasant to everybody. Why, that's right. Why not? Hey, bartender? Yeah. Same. And uh, whatever the lady prefers. Coming up. <laughs> you know, I feel sort of silly. Coming out here, I somehow got the idea that you were hard to meet. Carrie, I... You know, I was thinking how easily I could have won that dollar from Marblehead. All I'd have to do was to buy you a drink. And uh, maybe we could... Oh, Excuse me. I think I see an old friend of mine, Captain Irby. Good evening, Captain. Did somebody call? Oh. Small world, isn't it? I didn't know you for a second, Bradford. Maybe it's the fresh air in here. What are you doing out here in Nevada? Oh, now, that's funny. I was just going to ask you that. We've often talked about you, my friends and I. Remember those two friends of mine? We used to dig in the same sand pile together. Yes. Yes, this is quite a reunion. Maybe I ought to buy a drink on it. Oh, no, no, thanks. This time the treat's on me. Oh, I'm sorry, Captain Irby. This is Miss, uh, uh, oh, uh, uh no, don't tell me. <laughs> That's funny, I've forgotten it. You forget so easily, don't you, Mr. Bradford? Maybe. My name's Julia Adams. A pleasure, ma'am. Oh, of course, Adams. A toast, Captain, to Miss Julia Adams, the belle of the Sazerac Saloon. <laughs> Did you just arrive, Captain Irby? Uh, just today, ma'am. I find Virginia City is quite a union stronghold. <laughs> oh, yes, it's red, white, and blue all over. Oh, there are a few Southerners, of course, but they're harmless. Is that so? What do you think, Irby? I agree with the lady. What harm could a few Southerners do way out here? Hey, Mr. Bradford, a couple of fellows down the line want you to have a drink with them. Okay, thanks. If you'll excuse me, Miss Adams. Oh, uh, Captain Irby, it's been a pleasure to see you again. The pleasure is all mine, sir. I hope we'll meet again soon. Julie. Shh. Be careful, Ben. Where did you meet that man? He came west with me from St. Louis. Why? He was one of my prisoners at Libby for eight months. What? Stay away from him. Don't let him ask questions of you. He's a Union spy. A spy? Julie, listen. With him here, we'll have to work fast. I've already got Dr. Cameron and the others lined up. We'll leave in a wagon train. Ten wagons. We're bringing along the families for a blind. We'll head south into Arizona, then into Texas. 
You want to reach me? I'll be at the blacksmith shop behind Cameron's house. Julie, Julie, do you hear me? Yes. I hear you, Vance. What's the next move, Carrie? Yeah, and what's Irby doing out here anyway? I'm not sure. I got a hunch it's the same business we're on. Well, let me go get him the dead burn slab side of double cross. Oh, wait a bit. Not yet. We'll just watch him for a while. Get over there by the door, all right? When he leaves, give me a signal. We'll follow him. All right. Tom. Tom, are those wagons ready yet? Yes, sir. Just got to fix one more rim. Let it wait then. There's a man in town named Bradford, a union spy who knows me, knows why I'm here. You get someone to Armistead and Parrish and warn the others, I'll see Dr. Cameron myself. Yeah, but they're all back there now, in the house. Good. Now, here's what we'll do. Just we... stand right where you are, Captain. Hello. What's the back door? Evening, Mr. Bradford. Were you looking for me? Yes, among other things. Well, if I can help you in any way. Oh, you already have, just by being here. Oh, yes. Yeah. I remember now. We once made an appointment, didn't we? Well, gentlemen, I'm still at your service. Did you have in mind a four-handed affair tonight, or shall I take you tomorrow in alphabetical order? Uh, no. We don't want you alone, Obi. We let you leave the saloon because we knew you'd go straight to your friends. And I have an idea that that's just what you did. Now, you can either surrender peacefully, or shall we just begin pulling the place apart? Blacksmith, do you have any idea what he's talking about? Search me, mister. Uh, well, that's what I'm going to do. All that. Keep these men covered while I take a look at that back room. Get away from that door, mister. I'm afraid you can't persuade me. And maybe a couple of bullets will. Look out, Carrie. Don't let him out. Knock that lamp over. Get out. There he goes. Get him, Olaf. I can't see him. Well, don't let him get away. Grab him. Grab who? How can I grab? I got him. Let go, Olaf. You got me. Out oh. that way. Come on. It's no use, Carrie. They got away. Yeah. Well, listen. Get to Colonel Drury fast. Yeah? Tell him to call out the garrison. Block every road and street with mounted troops. Yeah. We'll get Irby if we have to rip this town apart. Now we know he's our man. That's right. I knew it as soon as he shot at me. Can I speak to you for a minute? Well, did you come back to tell me you liked the act? Well, not exactly. Matter of fact, though, it's a pretty good act. Thank you. Oh, I don't mean the one you put on down there on the stage. I mean the one you're putting on for me now. You see, Julie, I, I keep on thinking of you as well as the girl I met coming out here. Somehow I couldn't picture her in this place. You could the other night. Yeah, for a while. I'm sorry, Julie. I came here to ask you to forgive me. Carrie... No matter how much a man's in love, he still wonders if a woman's good enough for him. When a woman's in love, well, she's in love and that's the end of it. Julie, you once said that we should never climb mountains or cross bridges until we know what's on the other side. Well, I don't want to know. You can tell me anything you want and I'll believe you. That's about how much I'm in love with you, Julie. Oh, Carrie. Look, I may have to leave here soon. I'm not sure, but... Just in case I shouldn't see you again, I wanted you to know. Carrie, you're in some danger, aren't you? Well, Virginia City's a dangerous place. Besides, there's a war on. Yes, there's a war on. Could I see you for a moment, Captain Bradford? Yeah, well. Captain, someone saw Irby near the rear door of the Sazerac a half hour ago. Good. We'll take a look around. I'll be right with you. Yes, sir. Is that the real reason why you came here? I can't talk about that now. All I can tell you is, Julie, I love you. And that's more important than anything else in the world. Remember that, will you? Goodbye, Julie. My dear. Goodbye, Carrie. <gasps> Who's there? Diane. Julie, I must see you. Open the window. Shh. Vance. He's downstairs now. He's looking for you. Yes, I saw him. They found the hideout. Every street is blocked with soldiers. But we're leaving town tonight, and the gold is going with us. How? When? You've heard of Morel? Yes. Well, I made a deal with him. His men are camped only a few miles from here. Between 2 and 3 o'clock this morning, they'll attack the Eunice and Garrison. They'll draw every soldier out of Virginia City. We slip out of town with the last four wagons. 
The others are up in Box Canyon waiting for us. Waiting for... for us? You can't stay here now, Julie. Or would you rather stay? No. I haven't anything to stay for, Vance. I'll go with you, of course. Julie, there's just one thing left to be done, but it's the most important. And you're the only one who can do it. What is it? Go back downstairs as if nothing had happened. Send for Bradford. Tell him you know where I'm hiding. Send him to me. Send him... Send him to you? But why? Because he's the one man in Virginia City who could stop us. You want me to lead him into a trap? Yes, Julie. I can't do it, Vance. I can't. You must, Julie. You couldn't afford to leave him here alive. He knows too much about us. So you're going to kill him, aren't you? Oh, please, Vance, don't ask me to do this. Julie, Julie, this is war. I don't know what this man means to you. But before you answer, do you remember what Jefferson Davis said to us when we saw him? The hopes of ten millions of us will be riding with you. Yes, I remember, but... Can't you see it's murder, Vance? Worse than murder. Carrie, trust me. That's why I said only you can do it. What shall I tell him? Julie. Darling, what was it you wanted? Carrie, half of Virginia City knows who you are and why you're here. Why didn't you tell me? It's part of my job not to talk too much. I was going to tell you at the right time. There'll never be any right time. I know these southern people. I've lived amongst them. They're my friends. And they'd kill you before they gave up their gold. <laughs> well, you can't blame them for trying. They'll have to improve their aim a little first. Oh, Carrie, you mustn't go on with the search. Please, for my sake. I can't quit now, Julie. Not even for that. I've got to find Irby. All right. I can tell you where he is. What? Where? How would you know that? I told you they were my friends. Irby's in a hideout by himself. The boy who brought you my message will take you there tonight. But you'll have to go by yourself. Irby's ready to make a deal with you, to give himself up. If you come alone. How do I know I can trust him? How do you know you can trust me? If there was any danger... Do you think I'd let you go? That's good enough for me, Julie. Who is it? Bradford. Are you all alone, Bradford? Yes. Come in. I got your message. What do you want? There's not much I can expect, is there? Oh, about as much as you gave me in Libby Prison. So now you're going to collect for that tunnel? No, Irby. No, I'm going to forget about the tunnel. Oh, are you? Yes, it's not easy, mind you. After you've been digging in the mud for three months, you're bound to harbor a few grudges. But that was before I knew you were a Confederate spy. I presume you're giving yourself up. It's the logical assumption. Fine. But before we can make any kind of a deal, I'll have to know just where that gold's hidden, who your friends are. We're going to put them away where they'll be safe until the war's over. Even then, I can't guarantee that you won't be hung. You Yankees always did drive a hard bargain. But this time, I think we'll trade on my terms. Oh, you don't say. What would your terms be? I prefer your company to your life, Captain. Don't move your hands and turn around slowly. Allow me to introduce Dr. Cameron, Mr. Marshall, Mr. Armistead. All of them excellent marksmen. Oh. Uh, good evening, gentlemen. We're all ready to leave, Vance. You're going back home with us, Bradford, as an escaped prisoner of the Confederacy. Back to Libby Prison, in the sentence you ran away from. I hated to do it this way, but you were moving too fast for us. Irby, don't you think you're being a little optimistic? I doubt if you'll ever get out of this town alive. There's a squad of Union cavalry waiting for you at every street corner. I came here to give you a chance. I'm taking my chance, Captain. And your friends won't have much longer to wait. That's Morel, Vance. He's attacked the garrison. Right on time, isn't he? Well, shall we leave? Oh, excuse me. After you, Captain Bradford. Thanks. Oh, uh, by the way, Captain, do you know a young lady by the name of Julia Hain? Very well, Captain. Miss Hain is a loyal southerner. I see. <laughs> well, I always say it's nice to be loyal to something. Shall we go? <laughs> We 
pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. You're listening to the best of the old-time radio classics, and I'm your host, Jerry Hendigas. And now back to Errol Flynn and Martha Scott in Virginia City. After a brief intermission, Mr. DeMille and our stars Errol Flynn and Martha Scott will bring us Act Three of Virginia City. It's nearly dinner time in the Fraser household, and here's Mrs. Fraser looking in on her young guest. May I come in, Mary? Hmm, don't you look pretty. That shade of pink is a honey on you. You do look lovely. <laughs> Thanks, Jane. I feel good now. I certainly was all in when I got here after that long trip. But now I'm a brand new woman. That delicious Lux soap bath I just had did the trick. It certainly did. You look wonderful. All set to do a job on that new man Tom's bringing for dinner. Score again for Lux toilet soap. And for our thoughtful hostess, too. She's provided her guest with a toilet soap that makes a really luxurious beauty bath. When you step out of a Lux toilet soap bath, you know your skin is fresh, really sweet. It's fragrant, too, with the light, distinctive perfume Lux toilet soap leaves on the skin. Hollywood screen stars say, we love this delicate Lux soap perfume. And did you know how inexpensive this Lux beauty bath can be? A cake of this smooth white soap with the costly perfume is yours for just a few cents. Lux toilet soap is hard milled, so it lasts and lasts. Why not start tomorrow? Make your daily bath a fragrant, refreshing beauty bath with Lux toilet soap. Now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. The curtain rises on the third act of Virginia City. Out of Virginia City rolls the wagon train of the Southern sympathizers. With their families and all their possessions, they've hit the lonely trail into Arizona, loaded with gold, destined for New Orleans and the Confederate Army. At the head of the caravan ride Vance Irby and Julia Hayne, and beside them, tied to his saddle, is Kerry Bradford. Bradford, I'll make a bargain with you. From now on, it's going to be a tough trail and hard riding. You give me your word not to escape, I'll untie you. Thanks. But I think we'd better leave things the way they are. Don't want to make any promises I might not be able to keep. Suit yourself. Carrie, I'm sorry this had to happen. Sorry? For what? <laughs> you did a nice job. Congratulations. It was the last thing in the world I wanted to do. Well, I'll say this. You're the only one in the world who could have done it. Vance. Morell is here. Oh, how are you, Morell? That was good work the other day. Did you lose any men? No, three or four. They chased us 30 miles. Yeah, it's quite a party you have here. Ten wagons, huh? Which way you went? Straight south. Oh, that's the best route. Cut west this side of Las Vegas and miss the Union outpost at Mormon Station. Me and my men be glad to ride with you away. No, thanks. Oh, you ought to I'll have I'll pay it. you off tonight when we stop. As you say, Captain. Now tell my men. Thanks. That was a good tip about circling Marmon Station. Yes, a little too good, Dr. Cameron. I wonder if Morell knows we're carrying gold. You mean he might try to ambush us? There's no telling what Morell might do. We'll take no chances with him. What's the matter up there? Captain Irby. Yeah, what is it? Captain Irby. Bradford's gone. Bradford? He's gone, sir. He must got loose when we stopped to water the horses. Send ten men back along the trail. Tell them to scout both sides. Tell them not to come back without Bradford. Cut that message, mister. Hey, what the... What, what are you going to... Come on. Now you can send one for me. Sit down. There. Listen... You can't bust in here like this. Come on, this. get to work. This is important. I won't do it. You've got no right. Do you start pounding that key or I'll start pounding you. Now, what's the answer? Yes or no? Well, uh, yes. I thought you'd listen to reason. This is to Colonel Drury, garrison office, Virginia City. Gold train on immigrant trail heading south. Slower, will you? I can't send it that fast. Come on, immigrant trail heading south. Send force immediately. Equip for long chase. We'll wait for you here. Sign it, Bradford. This is 
way to win, Tuna. Looks like it. They camped here about two nights ago, then crossed the river and picked up their course. Due south. Couldn't be any plainer if they'd left us a map. Maybe they did, Colonel Drury. The question is, can we trust it? What do you mean, Bradford? Well, they must know they're being followed. It'll be the easiest thing in the world to cover up tracks like these. Why didn't they do it? You want my opinion, sir. If I did, I'd ask for it, Bradford. There are the tracks where they entered the river and where they came out on the other side. Well, if you'll excuse me, sir, there aren't enough tracks here for ten wagons. I'd say about four or five. Would you? Yes, sir. These tracks are decoys. They've loaded their gold under the other wagons and drawn us off the trail. The gold wagons have gained four or five days on us, either east or southeast. Colonel, why don't you give me four or five men and let me follow my hunch? Split the rest into patrols and spread out. We'll meet you at Sloan's Crossing, sir. All right. But I hope your hunch is good for your sake. Yeah, I hope so, too, sir. Carrie, suppose you ain't right. Oh, don't be silly, Marblehead. Look at those tracks. You think my hunch is good? Well, the way I look at it, uh, I don't know. Ooh. Well, with you along, Marblehead, how can I miss? Pull up there. Hey, Olaf? That a marker over there? It's a gravestone, Carrie. What's it say? Copy. Copy Gill. Age 11. Copy Gill. I knew that kid. And they must be finding it kind of tough along here. Yeah, one of them especially. This proves you was right about the gold train, Carrie. This is the way they was headed, all right. It also proves what those people have been going through. Weariness, thirst, starvation, probably. Hey, you two men over there. Ride back to Drury's force at Sloan's Ferry. No, sir. Tell them to follow us just as fast as they can make it. Captain Eddie? Well, what is it? Scouting party from up ahead, sir. Water hole is dry up there. Dry? Can't be. Not a drop in it, sir. All right. Take another party out. Keep looking. Yes, sir. How far to the next stream, Vent? If this one is dry, they all are. Then we mustn't let the others know. They're counting too much on it. I'll tell them that this isn't the place. We haven't reached it yet. Vance, I've got to talk with you. I know what you're going through. It's even worse for you than the rest of us. But we've given up too much already. These people can't go on. We can't make them. It's inhuman. War is inhuman, Julie. We're going on as long as we have the strength. How long will that be without food and water? Two, maybe three days. Nothing but desert between here and the Texas border. We'll still get through. Nothing else matters. Then something's happened to you. You're different. You're so alone. We all are. Vance! Vance! Get down, Julie. We're being attacked. What is it? It's Morel and his gang. They're on both sides of it. Morel? He must have found out about the gold. Pull the wagons into a circle. Quick there! Get them round this way! Close up! Close up! We ought to be almost up to him, Carrie. Those tracks look pretty fresh to me. Uh-huh. They'll have to camp for the night. That means we'll reach them before morning. And then what'll we do? Three men against maybe 50. Pull up. We'll have to send back for more. Pull up. Huh? Quiet. Well, that's just ahead of us, Kerry. Sounds like trouble. Come on. We'll ride to the top of that hill. That firing's just on the other side. There they are, Kerry. Six ways. They're being attacked. Keep down, all that. That's Morell's men attacking. They've got the wagons surrounded. What do we do, Kerry? Well, let's see. I imagine they could use three men. We'll go in and help Irby. What? Help him? Well, I wouldn't cut him down if he was hanging for a You'll week. You'll do what I tell you, mister. Sure, Kerry. You... Now, come on. Everybody on his horse and ride straight for the wagons. Ready? Ready. Now! Keep down off those wagons. You women, keep on the ground. When you reload, hand the guns up. We'll take them from you. Here comes three of them, Captain, down off the hill. Let them ride up close, then pick them up. They must be mad sending three men down. I'll take the first one, Van. Wait, wait. Hold your fire. Those aren't Morell's men. They're Yankees. Open up the circle. Pull that wagon out and let them in. Let those men in. The Yankees. Vance, it's Bradford. It's Kerry Bradford. I know who it is. Kerry. All right. Close up again. Close up. Mighty nice of you, Abby. Thanks. Hello, Bradford. Get it. Pull that wagon around. It's wide open there. You want to... <gasps> Hatchie. Vance. Vance. Feeling any better, 
there, mister? Sure. I'm not much help. Bradford, I'd, I'd like you to take command here. I've already done it. What's our chance of holding out? Ten to one. Against. When it's light, the crew will be down on all sides again. Our only hope's Drury. When? Maybe tomorrow. Maybe not for days. The gold. It's cost us so much. If any of us gets through, I'd like it to do some good. And so would I. But that's not up to me. Whatever happens to the gold, it's out of my hands. Bradford. The South can't win now. But the gold still belongs to our people. They'll need it. After the war. I told you it's not up to me. I can tell you one thing, though. Morell won't get it. But if Drury asks... That's all I can promise. Where is it? In the second wagon. Under the floorboard. You know, Bradford, I think you and I could have been friends. I think maybe we are friends. You, Dr. Cameron? Yes? What is it? Round up three or four men and hitch some horses to this wagon. Why this wagon? Because the gold's in it. Hurry up. I've got no time for explanations. So you're taking the gold and running out on us. I guess I misjudged you, Bradford. I thought you came to help us. Did you? Well, look, Doctor, you just take care of the wounded and I'll worry about the rest. Come on, get this wagon hitched up. Come on, come on, get work. Who told you where the gold was? Herbie. You better go to him, Julie. Vance wouldn't trust you. You must have tricked him. Oh, I'd rather Murel got it than the North. I've given my promise that he won't get it, and I'm going to keep it. This time tomorrow, none of us may care very much who has the gold or where it is, because we'll probably all be dead. But if it comforts you any to know, the gold will always be here in this canyon. What are you going to do? I'm going to put the wagon and the gold under, up under that cliff. A few kegs of gunpowder will blow ten tons of rock on top of it. When the war's over, and if we ever get word back, the southern people can come and take it. Wagon hitched up. Well, take it over there, under the cliff. Drive it over to the cliff. Carrie, why are you doing this? I don't think you'd understand, Julie. Olaf, you all set? All set, Carrie. And light the fuse. There's your Confederate gold, Miss Hayne. Carrie. Carrie, forgive me. Carrie, it's Drury. Drury. Open the circle. Open the circle and let them in. What do you mean, let them in? We're going out to meet them. Come on. Well, Bradford, looks like we got here just in time. Round them all up, Colonel. Good. What about Morell? Morell's dead. That was a personal matter. How many men did you lose, Bradford? Where are all that's left? Captain Irby was in command here. He passed it over to me just before he died. I see. Is the gold safe? Bradford, I asked you a question. Where's the gold? Uh, there is no gold, Colonel Drury. Is this your idea of a joke, Bradford? Have you searched the wagons? I've just told you, sir. There's no gold. Lieutenant Norman, have these wagons ready to move in an hour. We're going back to Virginia City and place Captain Bradford under arrest to be held for court-martial. <laughs> It is the verdict of this court-martial that you seized and withheld contraband of war for private reasons and are therefore guilty of high treason. Before final sentence is passed, is there anything else you wish to say in your defense? It's true I took the gold, but not for the reason the court infers. The court is willing to consider any reasons consistent with your obligations as a soldier. There are some things that aren't in the military code, sir, and this is one of them. My job was to see that the gold didn't reach the South. I did that job to the best of my ability because I knew it would only prolong the war. As the court knows, the gold did not reach the South. But those people, the men and the women and the children in that wagon train, I saw what they went through, sir. I saw them die for a cause they believed was right. And what did that have to do with you? Well, one of their men hoped that someday the gold would still reach the South where it belonged. He hoped that it would help them rebuild their homes and restore some of their pride. I don't think I can explain it any better than that, sir. Except I still believe I'm doing the right thing. That's why I refuse to deliver the gold. That's why I still refuse. It is a sentence of this court, Marshal, that you shall be executed on the morning of April 9th, 1865. Unless there be a countermanding order from higher authority. <laughs> Oh, 
said, unless there be a countermanding order from a higher authority. That's why I came to you, sir. I've always heard that President Lincoln was kind and just. I was afraid you wouldn't see me because I'm a Virginian. Why, I've got a lot of friends down south, Miss Hayne. And more relatives in Virginia than a Blue Ridge rabbit. I've sort of missed them these last four years. Let me see the records of this case, please. You can see from the testimony, Mr. Lincoln, there's no question of Bradford's guild under the military code. Maybe so. I'm not a military man. If we were not at war, sir, we Maybe might... Maybe they make... won't be after tomorrow. Mr. Lincoln. General Lee has sent for Grant to meet him in the morning at a place called Appomattox Courthouse. Then we've beaten them. Yes, I guess we have. But our work only begins there. And perhaps Captain Bradford's way will be our start. Then... And he won't be killed. No. Killing is over now. Miss Hayne, you've come over 2,000 miles to save the life of a man who was once your enemy. It may be because you admire what he did. Or it may be just because you love him. To me, you two people are symbols of what I hope we can do for our country. Thank you, sir. I'll tell them in Virginia City. I'll tell them everywhere. Yes, Tell them we are no longer enemies, but friends. That in my heart, and in thousands like mine throughout America, there is no spirit of revenge in our victory. There must be no harbor of hatred in their defeat. Tell them that we are now one people, united by blood and fire, and that from this day forward, our destiny is indivisible. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us now strive to bind up the nation's wounds, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Gold is where you find it, and so is good acting. We found both tonight, thanks to Errol Flynn and Martha Scott. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. Afraid we left a lot of bullet holes around here tonight, sir. <laughs> they say that over at Warner Brothers, if you want to find out where Errol Flynn is working, you just stop and listen for the shooting. <laughs> Scott, it. <laughs> That's quite a formidable weapon they've supplied for your new picture, Errol. Oh, you mean dive bomber, sir? Yeah. Well, we had plenty of exciting excitement making that one down at the Naval Air Station. But how about Reap the Wild Wind? Are you getting the Navy in that? History did it for me, Errol. It's a story of the Carolina, Florida coast. And incidentally, the whole city of Charleston is helping me film Reap the Wild Wind. They have a street there that hasn't changed for a hundred years, except for telephone and light wires. They didn't have those in 1840. So the city generously took them all down, which is real southern hospitality. <laughs> and we photographed Charleston exactly as it was 100 years ago. Well, that sounds like the second neatest trick of the week. Second? Why not the first? Well, the neatest trick of any week is the way Lux Soap helps to keep several million feminine complexions attractive. Score one for you, Martha. Pretty important to every woman to have a skin that's soft and smooth, and that's why Lux Soap Care is important. I've used it for years. Millions agree with you, Martha. And I'd say the only ones who don't are those who haven't tried Lux Soap yet. <laughs> What's doing here next week, Mr. DeMille? Plenty, Arrow. We're going to present They Drive by Night... And our stars are George Raft, Ida Lupino, Brian Dunleavy, and Lucille Ball. It's a story of the men who guide the giant trucks over the nation's highways and the peril that rides beside them as they drive by night. You'll hear George Raft and Ida Lupino in the same parts they played in the Warner Brothers picture and with Brian Dunleavy and Lucille Ball to help them. Opportunity knocks at this microphone next Monday night. It's an exciting subject for a play, Mr. DeMille. I know everyone will want to hear it. Good night. Good night. Good night. You can drop by and shoot up this theater any time, Errol. And now, before I say good night to our audience, I'd like to remind everyone listening that there's a part for all of us to play in national defense. We can all join the gigantic nationwide effort to keep America free by buying United States defense savings bonds. 
A bond may be purchased for as little as $18.75. At the end of 10 years, the same bond will be worth $25. Your bank or post office will give you full details about defense savings bonds. But remember that when you sign up for one of these bonds, you're putting your endorsement on the Declaration of Independence. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents George Raft, Ida Lupino, Brian Dunleavy, and Lucy Ball in They Drive by Night. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Martha Scott will soon be seen on the screen in the Columbia picture, They Dare Not Love. Included in tonight's play were Gail Gordon as Vance, Warren Ash as Murrell, Griff Barnett as Dr. Cameron, Edwin Max as Marblehead, Lou Merrill as Olaf, Theodore Von Elts as General Hooker, Hans Conried as Upjohn, Horace Taylor as Drury, and Charles Seal, Stanley Farrar, Edward Arnold Jr., and James Eagles. Our music is directed by Louis Silvers, and your announcer has been Melville Roy. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>